Okay. Welcome everyone to NYU Alumni of Indonesia Community. I am so pleased to have our first educational event on sustainability. It's such an important theme for Indonesia and the world. And we're so pleased to have our guests today, uh, which are renowned you know, leaders in this field. First is Darsona Hartono. He is the founder, president, director of PT Rimba Makmu Utuma. And also with us is Professor Tensi Whelan, who's a clinical professor of business and society, and also our director of the Center of Sustainable Business at Stern. Okay, so we're really thankful to have him here. And I just want to shout out to Daniel Budeman, who is a dear friend of Darsono for making that invitation. And Daniel is our parents council chairman of our community. So we're really happy to have him involved in this with us. So today we're going to have a one hour talk. We have about 65 participants who have registered. So if you have questions, please send the questions through the Q&A and we'll be monitoring that and through the chat. We're going to have a discussion first with Darsona and then with Sensi about their specific backgrounds and projects, and then we'll have Q&A, uh, which we've prepared, but also we want to know what you're interested in and the questions so you could be, you know, directly engaging with our participants or anyone else in the community and kind of share your thoughts. And you could certainly share your thoughts on chat as well. So we're looking forward to that and we'll be monitoring all of that. Okay, so I'm going to start with introducing Darsona. Um, he basically has an amazing life story about his passion for sustainability and what he's achieved in Indonesia. It is really the most amazing project. I've had the privilege of getting to know him. So I would like him to share with us today, what's the current status of his project and how we got there. It's the largest registered uh, forest preservation project in the world. He had many breakthroughs and challenges along the way. And we also want to know from here, what's the future and what he plans to do? What's the viability for projects like this in Indonesia? What he thinks will happen, especially after the current situation. Um, and um, the situation of how sustainability will be built upon what he's already done in Indonesia and as a leader in that field. Um, and how you all in kind of the NYU community and uh, the next generation can participate. So that's kind of a lot for him to go through. I'm going to turn it over to him and he could share um, his background and his project. Thank you, Judy. Um, um, thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to share the experience that I have. Um, I'm just going to start sharing the screen. The, hold on. Can uh, everybody see? Um, I guess, okay. So about um, 13 years ago, um, I met my business partner, Rezal Kusuma Maja, whom I went to Cornell with. He actually gave me a proposition and a challenge. He said that, Darsono, you can save the last remaining rainforest in Indonesia. Uh, you know, you can save the environment, clim mitigating climate change. You can actually, you know, help the communities to become more sustainable. And furthermore, you can make money out of this. Of course, this is 13 years ago. Sustainability was not sort of like the main agenda for everybody then. So he introduced me to the term of the triple bottom line, where you have people, planet, and profit. It sounds very foreign to me. For me, it's like, it doesn't make sense. All the things that we know that we learn from the Economics 101, something has to give. Right, whether it's the environment, it's the people, the resources that we have in the world. But I said, okay, he's a nice guy. And you know, he actually had a consulting firm. And he, I thought that he's just trying to pitch me an idea. But I think uh, you know, throughout these 13 years that, I, you know, that I've started cutting on the entire project, it's probably the most valuable 13 years that I have. Because not only that we prove there's a new business concept where you can have environment safe, you can have community making sustainable livelihood and furthermore you can make company profit so i think today i'd like to share that journey with everybody here and uh, hopefully it can give more uh positive uh, uh idea for other peoples to come so what is the business proposition the business proposition is basically we are trying to save the remaining intact 
peatland forest in Indonesia. Peatland forest is a type of forest where we call a wetland. It stored a lot of carbon. So if you know in this region, uh, Southeast Asia, every year Indonesia is being called the haze producer. It's a lot of this is because of the peatland that we have has been open for palm oil, for palm and paper. So the idea is to preserve this, to make it into a business uh, uh, model that is sustainable. But what are we selling? What we're selling is something called carbon credit. I know some of you are not very familiar with it. It's basically an environmental service that we provide that is being quantified in terms of how much emission that we're trying to avoid. So the area that we are talking about is in central Kalimantan. It's about 157,000 hectares. For some of you, 157,000 hectares is about two and a half times the size of island of Singapore. You know, and then uh, we are estimated that it will reduce 8 million tons of CO emission, you know, carbon dioxide emission per year, which is equivalent to about 2 million cars a year. So the, 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 the area that we're talking about is a peatland, and this is very prone to peatland fire. Um, because every time, once you open a peatland, it's very hard to bring it back. So what we're doing is we try to preserve what is intact at this time. So just zooming in, it's in, uh, you know, it's in central Kalimantan. It's involving 34 villages, you know, about 43,000 people. Uh, you know, the company uh, basically uh, granted co concession because Indonesia work on a concession basis. It's called ecosystem restoration concession. So we're only allowed to restore and to conserve this forest. So the business proposition is like this. Some people in the layman term, people will think that we work as an NGO, but we make a profit like a profit, like a private sectors. But what we're looking for is, you know, if there are two rivers along this area, basically communities live in this river, um, they do farming, they do illegal logging, they do all these things. What we're trying to propose to the community is, we will help you to become sustainable and become productive by not cutting the trees. So these are the business because by, the, by them not cutting the trees, the trees are being saved, that we can produce carbon credit on an annual basis. So what is it that we're producing and what we're selling? So what we're doing is we are selling environmental services. So we have to have a credibility of what we sell. The good news is the international world, there's a, 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 a standard institution called PCS, which is a verified carbon standard. They are the one who govern and doing all this scientific uh, certification for us in terms of how much calculation of carbon that we can produce or we can save in this matter. But not only that, they also are auditing us in terms of what are the things that we can do for community. So the business model of this is quite interesting. Not only that you are saving the environment, you have to transparently show that you are inclusive, that you are helping the communities providing sustainable livelihood. And this will be monitored and audited on an annual basis. What changes the past 13 years is that 13 years ago, people love this idea. People love this idea to a fact where, you know, everybody loves saving the rainforest, right? But I felt that 13 years ago, nobody's willing to pay for people doing this saving of the rainforest because they felt that this is more of an NGO kind of work. This is supposed to be a government kind of work. This should not be something that we pay to get this service. But I think the good news is the past 13 years, things has changed. We have the millennial that understand issue of the environment more. And then more and more people realize that we need nature for our survival for the next 100 years. Because we cannot continue to do what we do, destroying nature, because we know that's the survival for our future. So we need to value them as we speak. So the project had issued 20 million tons of credits, we call it. We have uh, major buyers like Shell, Volkswagen, and they are doing this on a voluntary basis because they identify that a lot of the consumer like this idea of saving rainforest. That, you know, not only that we are protecting the environment, we also are transparently making the communities more sustainable over time. So we have uh, buyers like Shell, Volkswagen, you know, I think just to give you an idea, Volkswagen just uh, uh, launched a new car called ID3, which is a, a new generation for Golf. And they claim that, you know, while it's a fully electric car where there has no emission, the manufacturing of that car is being offset. So the term offset is something that we use for this world, for this uh, uh, industry. Basically, you 
can, while well, you're actually emitting carbon to what you do, you can offset it by doing something good elsewhere. So um, like I said, this is not just about saving the environment, but it's also helping the communities to be more sustainable. So this is just a broad idea of how much we, you know, the project. So the idea is how can we help communities to be sustainable? Of course, it's not easy to change um, basically a habit for communities, right? It's not easy to tell people where they used to do burning, but now they can, they have to do more sustainable farming. But that's what we do. As a company, we invest in this because we felt that all this productivity and project activities that we have, it's gonna give us a long-term benefit. So more and more studies show that a, a company that has purpose like us, not only that is mitigating climate change, we also are inclusive. It's the one that can be sustainable for the next 100 years. The old days mantra where shareholders value are more profit is no longer exists in the world today. So I think these are the things that we do, but of course, this is not easy. You know, I can, I can share with you that the first six years of my company, I was the only employees, you know, and um, finally, after we got the concession in 2013, now we have, you know, more than 800 staff in my payroll. But not only that, it took us 10 years to make our first sales, which is a lot of people think, you must be crazy, Darsono. How can you do some business like that? But I said, you know, sometimes, Hindsight is easy to set, but I think I have to be very grateful and thankful that I have a wife that support this because a lot of people think like, how can you as an entrepreneur be sustainable and really hang in there, even though you know you're doing the right thing, but by not making money for 10 years, not only not making money, you're not making any sales. How can it be possible? But I guess sometimes these things just come for me naturally to a point where what I do I felt that it's really helping people. But at times when I almost gave up, of course, you know, my wife will come to me and said that after two years and three years, I used to work at JP Morgan in the bank. And then she'll come to me, babe, maybe it's time for you to cut loss. You know, we know there are times when you just do something, you can, you know, you know that you are really deep under and you just cut loss and you move on. But every time I'm about to cut loss, I go to the, the villages, I spoke with the people and it's, it gave me hope that a lot of people in Indonesia actually want to do the right thing. You know, communities give me hope to a point where they want to change. And my company presence, where I felt like we can change at the same time. So I think, uh, you know, these are the new future that we see. A lot of people don't see it. I think uh, where they always told me like, Darsono, you're ahead of your time 13 years ago. People don't talk about sustainability, but I think I was just lucky. I was just lucky to have that opportunity. The fact is now every business look into the model where it has to be inclusive. You have to make sure that you have a, a, a way to mitigate your climate, you know, basically your carbon footprint. It's something that we've been working for a long time. But I just want to share with you the next few slides in terms of what we do, and I will be happy to have the Q&A uh, to next one. So, but of course, what we do, we focus in a new UN Sustainable Development. So I think uh, these are the few issues, you know, we have identified at least nine SDG that uh, we want to look at. Um, you know, I'm just gonna go through the slide quickly so we can have more discussion. But I think, you know, it's about how can this initiative of coconut sugar that we have is to look at what natural capital available and how we can help communities to change that natural capital available. So in this case, in our perimeter of our concession, there are a lot of coconut plantation we actually help them and teach them to not only produce regular copra or coconut, but we make into sugar. It actually increased their income four to five times. But of course, out of the 15,000 community that own a coconut plantation, when we started, there's only two farmers doing this. So we have to start doing this from the bottoms up. And uh, we started a, a school for, for the Coconut Training Center. Now we have about 500 farmers doing it. So these things, you know, as a, as a project developers, we have to look at what are the natural capital provided and how we can use our knowledge and expertise to help this so that it provides better livelihood for the communities. Next, we also do something of cattle management that we have. So basically, we, we, we work with the 
st other stakeholders such as Toyota Foundation to see how we can work together. So the strength of our project is while I was the only employee for the first six years, we engage with 67 institutions or stakeholders. You know, I always believe that I'm not the smartest. I always believe that I can work. You know, it's the strength of our cutting and Mentai project is our collaboration with others. So we work with Clinton Foundation. We work with Toyota Foundation. We work with the USFS with all these experts that I feel that is better knowledge than me. That's how we thrive. And um, another thing that we look, we look into is basically improved sanitation. And a lot of this, just to let you know, changing behavior is not easy. Changing farmers' behavior where they get used to what we call slash and burn into agriculture, best agriculture practice take time. But I think if you really have a good, strong foundation of what you believe in, a strong vision that you are helping them, you know, and being truthful and being honest with the communities on the ground, there's only good things can happen in the future. So, you know, these are just a few other initiatives that we have, and I'll be happy to share, uh, to also answer any question in the future, uh, uh, further. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much, Dasona. It's amazing, and the pictures really showcase everything, so I love your slides, okay? We're gonna go for the question section after that, but first, I'd like to introduce Tansi Whelan. Um, Tansi has led the Rainforest Alliance and has achieved so much there, and we were so happy to have us at our NYU Center for Sustainable Business. And so Tansi, I want to ask you, I know that you've been engaging with and researching the business case for sustainability with companies and industries. Uh, I would love for you to share what you're doing on your research at NYU and with the students um, there and what they're working on, and also how you partner for greater impact to amplify the work that you do you know, with governments and businesses as well. Thank you, Tansi. Thank you so much, uh, Judy, and challenging to follow Darsano, who's doing such terrific work and, and with such passion and, and, and that kind of stick to stick to it -ness that you have, you know, <laughs> tenacity uh, is really, really important and it's terrific to hear how, how well it's going. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, we, we worked on as well when I was running Rainforest Alliance. So let me see about sharing my screen here. Um, uh, Judy, can, is, can you see that? Everybody can see it? Yep. Great. Perfect. Um, so, uh, let's see. So, the, we, um, when I came to Stern about uh, five years ago at this point, we launched the Center for Sustainable Business, and our vision is a better world through better business. And we believe that we're helping to prove the value of sustainability for business management and performance at a time when people on the planet need it most. And really preparing individuals with the skills, tools, knowledge that they need to embed sustainable um, practices core to their business strategy. So no, it's no longer a sort of nice to have off to the side, but really how you do your business. Um, and we, let me close this here. Um, you know, the, the types of work that we do at the center focus first on education. So we've developed undergraduate and graduate specializations in sustainable business. We have executive MBA courses. I have an online uh, certificate course for people all over the world. We have executive to, um, courses online now, but also in person. And then we do a lot of work with students around internships and fellowships. We actually did a um, CERN solution project uh, in, in Indonesia with smallholders um, on palm oil and helping to figure out how they could access financing for better sustainability practices. Um, research, I'm going to talk more about that. So we are doing a variety of different areas of research that are really focused on helping practitioners um, uh, better embed sustainability core to business strategy. Um, and then we do a lot of events and networking and outreach uh, with CEOs, um, with specialists, uh, with panels on different topics such as supply chain, sustainable supply chains and blockchain technology, for example. So if you'd like to get involved with us, um, you know, please look us up. We have an alumni LinkedIn group. 
where NYU and Stern alums working in sustainability are encouraged to network. And this is corporate sustainability or finance, or even if you're just interested. Um, and then, um, you know, feel, do feel free to reach out to us if, if you'd like to, uh, to get engaged in any way. Um, Judy also asked me to say a little bit about Rainforest Alliance, which I ran for 15 years and which is what brought me to Indonesia um, some time ago. Uh, we did a lot of work around um, sustainable forestry and agriculture, working as well with um, carbon standards and certification. Um, as some of the work that you heard about is some of the areas that we were, that we were that Desano was working in, we've worked on a bit as well. Um, and Indonesia, I must say, is such a beautiful country. I felt very privileged to go there and meet with some of the communities that we were working with around sustainable forest management. It was very inspiring. Um, Rainforest Alliance, sort of sustainable practices in agriculture and forestry, and this is some of the percentages. So in Coco, for example, um, uh, Rainforest Alliance is certifying 30% of the world's cocoa. And what does that mean exactly? It's really about how do you redesign standards for implementing uh, uh, practices that have been done the same way for 100 years, you know? So banana production, lots of chemicals, lots of deforestation, poor labor practices, um, lots of erosion, eradication of biodiversity. Um, it doesn't have to be done that way, right? So we worked with a multi-stakeholder group to design uh, banana standards that improve sustainability and work with Chiquita and other companies to implement those standards that include things like instead of um, putting chemical defoliant on the canals between the bananas, you put a grass. Uh, instead of doing area spraying, you do spot spraying of chemicals. Instead of putting a fungicide into the water where women dip their hands into the, with the bananas, um, you just have regular water and you put a little fungicide on the stalk of the bananas, which is where the fungus grows. So those types of changes are what we work on in forestry, um, obviously a whole different set of standards and, and criteria. Um, and so that's Rainforest Alliance. So let me turn to, I want to share with you two um, research initiatives that we're working on at Stern that I thought might be of interest. So the first is, um, you know, Narsa was talking a bit about the, you know, the business case, right? And that, that 10 years ago, it was very hard to find people who believed that there was a business case. And there's still a challenge with this. Um, you know, we find numerous studies are finding that there's a positive correlation between corporate performance on material environmental and social and governance issues and corporate financial performance. And the materiality is important because people sometimes do a bit of greenwashing. They'll do something that isn't really relevant or core to their business. That might be a good environmental thing, but really isn't about how they do their business. And that is, does not qualify. Um, but when you, when, one of the challenges is that corporations on their sustainability strategy. So they might have in place a good forest, um, you know, sustainable forest um, procurement program, but they're not tracking what kind of returns come from that. Um, this means that both corporate and investor decision making is weakened by this lack of information. Um, and there's, you know, challenges in, in how to measure it. Um, you know, many sustainability strategies are not tied to total return from the outset. The, there's a lot of strategies. They, strategy and execution sit within different units of the company. The financial benefits are tracked differently by different units and not aggregated. Some are intangible, for example, employee engagement um, or reputational risk, um, and therefore difficult to measure. It's often not clear to the finance function that they should invest in actually putting in place the infrastructure to track this stuff. And, and currently, though this is changing, investors and board members are not asking for the return on sustainability investment, or ROSI, as we call it. But this, again, I, we're, we're starting to get a lot of companies coming to us for work with ROSI saying their investors are interested. So ROSI, the Return on Sustainability Investment Framework we developed, um, shows a series of mediating factors that come when a company embeds sustainability in its strategy and practice, which range from customer loyalty, better uh, employees, more innovation, more operational efficiency, uh, improved risk management, et cetera, which then drives better profitability, valuation, and lower cost to capital. Now, these mediating factors can be driven by things other than sustainability. You know, any good management can drive those things. But what we're seeing is that sustainability is actually the next um, wave of good management. And when I say sustainability, I mean social as well as environmental, as well as good governance. So I thought I'd share with you a few case studies. 
Um, we were working with, with REI, which is a, a, a retailer uh, that carries outdoor clothing. And they have a very strong purpose. They're an employee-owned company. They are very much focused on the art doors and conservation, and that really permeates their whole culture. So we looked at, um, you know, does that culture actually result in reduced turnover and increased productivity? And if so, how might you monetize that? And what is the net benefit to REI? And what we found um, is that indeed, um, they, reduced, they did have reduced turnover and increased productivity against um, industry vendors. So we, we uh, monetized that and then we subtracted, they have two paid time off days that are mission aligned where they go and they work in the outdoors. And we thought, well, that's sort of part of creating that culture. Um, so we uh, subtracted that and we came to about a net benefit of 34 million or approximately 5% of payroll expenses, which you know, is pretty significant for, for a company in terms of return on investment. Then we worked with a company called Capital Power that was trying to decide if it should get out of, car, out of coal earlier. Um, it's a utility in Canada. Um, and through using Rosie, it found that there, and we, again, we use very conservatively, but that they would have improved retention and labor productivity as well as lower cost of capital, which was actually the biggest one because increasingly investors are concerned about coal-based um, uh, utility providers. Um, and that that would lead to um, net benefits over um, a period of 31 million. And that, in addition to the other traditional analysis they did, um, caused them to exit, make the decision to exit coal early. And in fact, their stock valuation went up as a result of that. Another one we looked at was uh, deforestation free supply chain commitments, working with McDonald's and Carrefour in Brazil and looking at um, beef in Brazil. And we found that sustainable agriculture practices improved productivity and profitability, um, which led to uh, net benefits for the farmers of about um, a seven times increase in profitability or about $30 million um, in NPV over 10 years, which is really significant. Um, and then slaughterhouses and retailers, we also were able to monetize often intangible benefits such as reduced risk, reputational and operational, um, but also um, things like premium because um, the better agricultural practices resulted in higher quality product, for example. And then my final study, we worked with the automotive sector, um, GM, VW, Aston Martin to look at um, uh, Rosie in that sector. And some examples, we saw that um, proactive investment in reducing recalls, which is a material ESG issue, according to the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. When we looked at all the different costs, which interestingly, these companies hadn't been, um, when we pulled them all together, we found that for one company that had more than a dozen recalls one year, it was a half a billion dollars impact, right? So in theory, if you invest $100 million up front in avoiding that, you would have saved $400 million. Um, waste management. So we saw things like um, companies recycling paint and solvents. Um, and when you recycle paint and solvents, you, um, uh, you no longer buy the virgin stuff, you no longer pay the waste disposal costs, and you actually had extra to sell. So we saw an, an annual EBIT impact of about 235 million due to their waste reduction strategies. And then we saw in Europe where companies are required to reuse and recycle or take, take, take responsibility for the end of life of their vehicles, that one company had a net savings of $100 million due to reusing 2.5% and recycling 10% of the um, automotive um, autos that were returned to them areas of resources if, online if you're interested in, in learning about this. And then quickly, our second, a second um, research initiative that I thought I'd share with you that we literally just last week announced the update on, we do this annually. We're working with IRI, which is a company that collects barcode data from retailers all across the United States. So this unfortunately is just the United States, but interesting to understand what's happening with markets here. So we asked if purchases of sustainable products increased over time, and this would be consumer packaged good products, personal care products and food products. So yes, up from 13.7 to 16%, but the big story is that they're responsible for 54% of the market growth in consumer packaged goods from 2015 to 2019. Um, and you can see across all these different categories, the purple is the sustainability marketed products. 
that in almost all categories, sustainable products were outgrowing or outperforming the conventional products. So this is a trend that um, looks pretty um, much here to stay. And so then we said, well, is this impacted by COVID? Um, you know, and what we find is that purchases of these products are continuing to grow in the face of the pandemic. This shows you during, we had a huge spike here when everybody was panicking. Um, and you, the purple is the um, sustainability marketed products. And you can see um, those purchases as a percentage, um, you know, also went up sizably. Um, and I'll skip to here. So they've gone up um, 0.6 points overall since 2019. So people are not stepping back from this. Um, and that's, that's um, also we wanted to look at what types of categories um, uh, are people more likely to buy? Are there some that perform better or well, uh, less well? And so here we looked at products that have more than a 20% share. For example, yogurt has a 70% share of sustainability um, marketed products. Um, and um, you see things that have less than a 5% like laundry detergent or toothpaste. But again, uh, those are growing very quickly. Then we asked, um, what about price, right? What's the premium? Are people willing to pay the premium? And what we found is a really, really big premium. Uh, so from 2004, which is about 35% to 2018, um, was 39%, so a 5% increase. So people, the, the sector was growing 50%. At the same time, people were charging, you know, between 34 and 39% premium. Um, and here you can see the range because obviously that was aggregated across the different products. There's a few products that are charging less, but most are charging 30 to 40% premium. And I can tell you having worked in this space, it is not costing these companies 30 to 40% premium. So they're making significant money on these sustainable products. And this is just demonstrating, you know, sort of the, the growth along with the price increase. Also lower price sensitivity, those companies that had, um, that were sustainable um, and that in the food area were, had the greatest price leverage. In other words, they could charge more. Um, so that's, um, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, wanted to make sure we have a good, good amount of time left, but those were just two of the research initiatives that we're working on that address some of your questions, Judy. Okay. Thanks so much, Tansi. I'm so impressed of the business case, both that you have actually clearly shown and also Darsono in making the case to kind of the largest companies like, you know, Volkswagen and Shell and so on. So I actually want to just touch on that more and kind of push that and push back a little bit on that, right? Because over the last few years, we've certainly seen sustainability report cards now are required. It's required as part of the accounting uh, regulations. It's required as part of kind of the ESG metrics that most boards are looking at. And I know when working on the board work that I sit on boards, um, there are board subcommittees that focus on ESG, but, is it happening or you know obviously we'll all say because if we're passionate about this that's not happening enough right and then i'm just wondering what is really happening um how come it takes so long where the numbers in terms of the premiums that people are willing to pay now where Darsona said people were not willing to pay for it before and your research also shows Tansi, that people can actually charge premiums for products is this across the board or is it only millennials? I'm just curious about that. So I'm gonna start with you, Tansi, on the questions for, you know, are people in the marketplace really willing to pay for this? And are corporations at the topmost level of the house really, you know, aware that that's happening and how do you reach them? And then for um, Dasono, um, talk to us about how the challenge was to convince these large corporates to buy these credits, right? And outside of the fact that the stand just have to be audited and all of that, you know, how, what changes the corporate mindset? Okay, Tansi, I'll start with you. Sure, so on the first part of your question about, you know, is this just millennials? So first of all, yes, millennials have a higher percentage of purchasing products, but um, baby boomers and Generation X are actually the bigger um, because there are bigger cohorts and, and are purchasing, have more purchasing power, actually quite significant as well. Um, so I think we'll continue to see the growth as millennials move into that, you know, larger purchasing group. Um, 
uh, there's a question here asking if, if the research is just in the US. And unfortunately, it is because IRI, who's our partner to get all this data, um, does not collect this data in Asia. We don't have access to this type of data. If anybody knows anyone who is collecting the data and can get us a partnership, um, we'd be thrilled to do this in other regions. Um, then secondly, you asked about the corporate side of things. You know, how serious are they? How pervasive is this? Uh, you know, I'd say the, biggest, the bigger brands that get a lot of scrutiny and have a lot of reputational impact that are publicly owned, um, uh, while they continue to make mistakes and while they definitely have wide variety in how embedded their sustainability programs are, they are recognizing that this is something that they have to do. I think 90% of companies in the standard S&P um, 500, I think it is, are now issuing sustainability reports. You know? So it's something that they know they need to do and that they're getting increasing pressure from investors around. Um, that said, I would say that you know, um, we have a lot of pressure by private equity and hedge funds who purchase a lot of you know, parts of companies and companies and who are just focused on the financial bottom line and uh, you know, increasing margins. We have a lot of pressure um, to do share buybacks and things that are not um, you know, sort of investing in the long-term future of the company. Um, and, the, you know, and then for private companies and smaller companies, there's less focus. Um, so it has to be sort of personal commitment by the company. So that's why I think this business case that Darsana was making, that we're making is really essential to mainstreaming it. So we move people out of this well. I would do it if I could afford to do it, but I can't and nobody else is making me do it. So, you know, I'm just gonna do things the old way. That's something we really have to change. Okay, and Darsama, can you focus on how you actually were able to convince corporates and investors to come on board and what you need to do now where they've actually seen, you know, your case work, um, how hard is it and how to continue that trajectory? So I think uh, if you look at the experience that we ha that I have personally, the past 13 years is quite challenging. When I started this, for me, I'm a, I'm a, I used to work in a bank. I used to work for JP Morgan. So I used to do real estate underwriting. So for, you know, it was very clear for me 13 years ago, do I want to own a forest or do I want to own a real estate? What are, how does this asset appreciate? It's a very simple idea that I have because we thought uh, that I thought that basically environment will be a new asset class in the future. But what I don't know is the challenges as I see, because one, you know, I believe at, when I started this of carbon offsetting is something that people are not very comfortable talking. The reason why they say carbon offset, it basically sort of let the company like the shell of the world, you know, the BP of the world continue to pollute themselves. And then finally, but in the meantime, they can offset their sin by buying credit from us. So the business proposition was not clear 13 years ago. And secondly, a lot of NGOs start looking at us and attacking corporate like us that is doing things like this. The fact is we are managing two and a half times the size of Singapore. They claim that we are new capitalism. It's a new neo-colonialism where big companies owning huge sets of land will be displacing all the communities and they're going to make a lot of money. But the good news is since we are the largest project in the world in terms of number of emission that we produce, we transparently can show to them, not only that we as a big company running this, you know, owning this land, we have to, when I mean have to, we have to make sure that the communities are sustainable. Because if not, then we will not get our certification. So this is a new business model where technically you have to make community as your quote unquote shareholders. So finally, the NGO starts seeing the real impact what we do. We are doing it much better than a lot of other NGO doing. We, we, have, we have a mission driven, but also feel like there's a profitability so it can be sustainable. In the meantime, you start seeing a lot of the company, the oil and gas company are also doing their best to lower their emission. So they are not, they don't have sort of like the rights to pollute mentality anymore. They will do everything. And then once they cannot do all that thing anymore, then they start looking into offset. So if you look at, for example, Shell, Shell starts seeing that about three, four years ago. After Paris Agreement was signed, they look into this and they look into the consumer, which are, which are the millennial that understand this. So Shell launched a, what we call a driving program. 
in, in, in Netherlands now, in the UK. So basically, if you said that you are buying this certain type of fuel in the gas station, they will offset partial of that fuel into project like us. But if you don't want to buy that particular fuel, but you want to buy a cheaper one, you can actually voluntarily, you know, basically offset one cent or two cents. They have done this research and they see that the consumers are actually very keen to do it. So again, like I said, Judy, there's a willingness to pay because more and more people understand saving nature is important, but projects like us, not only we're saving the nature and the biodiversity, we're also helping the community to be inclusive. So that business is very clear. So, you know, I think therefore you start seeing Shell and Volkswagen seeing that because they can see a big project like us transparently show the benefit on the ground. So to answer some of the question as uh, I see in the chat, you know, does this spread outside the US and Europe? Is it going to Asia now today? But I think I can tell you that it is because doing good can be profitable. I think that's the mantra that we have now. It's not, you know, ESG, it's not a CSR, but doing good, doing with a purpose can be profitable. So I give you an example, you know, I. I had an encounter, uh, you know, basically Ho Ching, which is the Temasek uh, chair of women. And three, four years ago, she already seeing that there's uh, externalities because all we do have externalities. Sooner or later, we have to price these externalities. Your consumer is going to demand you to do it, right? No consumer is going to say, oh, if you're polluting, I'm not going to buy anymore. So this become a new norm. And I think Temasek really understand that now they actually one of our consumer at this time. And they, you know, she actually start telling all of the subsidiary and start calculating what kind of carbon footprint you have. And then see if there's a way we can offset this. So changes are coming. You know, I think uh, it needs a lot of big, you know, all multi-sector, not just the oil and gas or the automotive. But I think once the bank is involved, once the basically a uh, Tamasek of the world get to be involved, all this, you know, pension fund get involved and things will shift. But I think it's very clear that Saving nature is important. I know some people even to extreme saying that all this pandemic that we see today is actually the cause of deforestation. All these things that we have, of course, you know, it cannot be proven directly, but I think there is a case for that. So that's how I, I see that, you know, as a company, you have to make sure you have a purpose. You know, you cannot just make an excuse of making money anymore. For the next, you know, 100 years, you have to have a purpose, whether it's inclusive or whether it's mitigating climate change or both. So that's how I see that the, 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 the trend is moving. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you touched upon the pandemic, so I'm going to also kind of ask the question around that. Um, there's so many crises happening right now and companies now are just looking at resilience, being able to survive with cash flows, um, investors are pulling back, there's a, you know, joblessness, there's, you know, a lot of uncertainty in the world, right? So does this get pushed back to the back burner? And then also, you also said something that we have seen repeated in news and so on, because there's a downturn, airlines, transportation is halted, uh, industries and economic slowdown. Uh, everyone is saying worldwide, the actual um, air quality has improved dramatically, right? So we've got both sides, right? We've got the fact that we actually have situations where most large companies, even if they would like to, may not be able to invest in sustainable practices to turn it around at this point. Um, it may not be top of mind because they have kind of survival at stake, a you know, short-term survival, not the 100-year survival scenario. And at the same time, we're benefiting in a kind of funny situation um, from you know, a really nice uh, kind of impact on sustainable in terms of air quality and so on. So are there lessons learned in this? And I could see it playing both sides, right? So I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, Pan. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first point I'd like to make is that coronavirus is sort of a warm up for climate change. And, and, and when I say that, it's because coronavirus is an exponential problem, right? You start with one person sick and suddenly next, you know, second you have 10. And, and so it's an exponential growth problem. And climate change is the same thing. Uh, and only it will be even more devastating because it affects so many different elements of our natural world, which then affect us. This next decade is a decisive decade 
for ensuring that we at least maintain, you know, just just a 1.5 degree increase, you know. Um, and, and if we continue on our current trajectory, we're talking about four degrees. And it's just, I mean, we can't, we can't survive in the world we have today with that kind of an increase. And, and again, once it starts, it just, it goes, it goes like this, right? So I think the coronavirus has showed us how vulnerable we are, how fragile our world is, how quickly things can get out of control. And we need to take that lesson and apply it to our businesses in terms of how we think about climate change which is already affecting our business. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of companies sort of dealing with short-term challenges, of course, they've got to deal with them. But I think um, what they need to be thinking about is how do, we, how do we use this to build back better, right? How do we, first of all, treat, you know, if we have to lay off people, how do we do it with respect? How do we think, um, how do we do our best not to lay people off? I mean, what we're seeing in some cases is, companies giving their CEOs bonuses, their whole C-suite bonuses and doing share buybacks at the same time they're laying off, you know, 100,000 people. Um, a particular hotel company did that. So let's avoid that kind of thing. <laughs> and let's see sacrifice shared across the whole company, right? Um, and, and I think, um, uh, you know, as well, um, those companies, typically when you see crisis, right, there's studies that have been done that one, companies that avoid layoffs to the extent possible and treat their people well, are more competitive, come out of it better. Two, using this as an opportunity, for example, if your factories are down, use that as an opportunity to retrofit them, to reduce your energy, right? Like, because normally it's challenging when everything's going at the same time. Um, those companies that had been working on their supply chains prior to the COVID, um, who really understood their, the, you know, their supply chains were more transparent to them, actually have had less problems than those traditional companies that just had a transactional relationship with their supply chain because they had no idea what was going on anywhere and all of a sudden, you know, COVID exploded and they couldn't really figure it out. Whereas those that had those relationships were still affected but knew who to talk to, where to go, what to figure out, you know, they're on, on the sustainable front. I think we're also seeing, and Darsano mentioned this, is that, you know, the um, investors are seeing this as a wake up call for the fragility of business overall and for the importance of focusing on ESG. So we've seen more inflows into ESG um, investments. We've seen better performance of ESG investments. We've see, we're seeing now uh, Morgan Stanley just joined a whole series of banks around creating a carbon standard for assessing the emissions in their portfolios, investment and loan portfolios where they can begin to reduce those, um, those emissions. Uh, in other words, stop loaning to or stop investing in those companies in a much more robust way. So this is here to stay and companies that put their head in the sand, so, so to speak, um, are gonna be those companies that fail. This is the new wave of innovation that they need to get out ahead of and innovate um, to, to, to uh, have competitive advantage. Okay, great. Dostoma, there's some questions that our members wanted to ask, so I'm going to combine a few um, in addition to any comments you have on the previous question. But uh, people are wondering about the policy in Indonesia and its support on sustainability. How do you continue to do the work you do? Are there other projects like that? And is the policy actually going to be even more expansive in Indonesia and, you know, other insights into other parts of Asia? And then how did you finance the project, you know, 13 years ago when you were a visionary and, you know, you had to convince people. So how did you, you know, arrange the financing to build up the project over 13 years? So thank you. Uh, those are great questions. I think when the pandemic, when it happened, you know, when, you know, February, when it came to me, I'm like, well, we're going to have a great year this year, right? Everybody's like looking into this uh, space now, you know, carbon credit, airline, transportation, and suddenly when March came, I was like, oh no, how are we gonna, what's gonna happen to me, right? I mean, is this gonna be the back burner, just like you said, Judy. But what interesting that I see, believe it or not, until today, we might break our last year sales. We still see a lot of bits in the market, right? You know, people start seeing this, just like Tenshi said. People, apparently they realize that what we're doing, you know, what happened with COVID, we don't want that to happen in climate change. I think it's sort of like a wake up call to a lot of people. All these people that have made commitment, they are not uh, walking away from that commitment. And we start, so we still start seeing a lot of bits and even more buyers in the market than we have ever seen. So it did, that's a good news because uh, it shows that people are really, really understand that, you know, you have to take care of climate change seriously. 
Um, I think with regards to Indonesia, in the meantime, you know, Indonesia, when I started this 13 years ago, people, you know, the government is like, what are you selling? Are you sure you're going to be able to sell this? And there are a lot of skepticism in terms of what I do and what we do. But we, can, we just continue, we prevail. But the good news is finally now with the Jokowi administration, they believe that Indonesia, given that we have a huge asset in forestry, in mangrove, in ocean, all this natural capital, that it can worth something if we protect it. So I think the new government mentality is different now. They start seeing that you know, this new business model makes sense. Because not only that, you know, you can protect, you have to protect the environment, you also have to provide sustainable livelihood and be inclusive. So I'm more and more optimistic about the Indonesian path, in this case, you know, protecting the environment, forestry particularly, and hopefully we are not going to export all this haze to Singapore in the next year, you know, 10 years to come. How do I convince my investor? I mean, I, as an entrepreneur, it's always a challenge. I mean, I started this at 2007. I actually spoke with easily 200 investors trying to pitch my idea. None of them really came in. I mean, it took, I think I asked, like my 201, finally, I, I, I had an investor from the UK to believe in what I do. But it is so hard. I cannot imagine, you know, when you are in a pioneer in what we do. But the good news is I think we have a partner that is uh, really care and understand the issue. And uh, it, this is one of the best investment that he had ever made. Technically, you know, after... 13 years, uh, you know, we uh, have not only that uh, we are profitable, we are very profitable, you know, the valuation is right there. But I think, uh, of course, hindsight is easy, right? You can look back. But again, I really have to uh, really thank my wife because without my wife's help, I will not be able, I mean, imagine if <laughs> for 10 years, I'm not making any income. But I think I'm lucky that I have a wife that works, that is a very successful uh, uh, career person. So uh, I'm grateful for that. But I think uh, you know, what I'm trying to tell people is sometimes, you know, if you know what you're doing is right, with the current world now, you know, if you have a purpose like that, I'm sure, you know, if there's a business proposition that you can actually propose, sooner or later, you're going to prevail. It's a matter of time. But I think not, it's, it's easy, it's hindsight, because I'm, I succeeded, but I'm sure, you know, during the eight year, the nine year, there are times when I decided to like throw the towel, but uh, I'm glad that I did Okay, so I'm going to ha, thank you so much. I'm going to ask you both the last question because uh, you know we're getting to the top of the hour. Okay, you have uh, you're both in a position to influence the next generation leaders. What would be your ask for the next generation? Um, keep in mind you have some students, you have some alumni graduates, you know, ranging from um, you know all years from fresh graduates to people who graduated more than 30 years ago on the call So just what are your final thoughts on that? And I'll start with you Darsono What would you ask about next generation and I'll have 10 sequence with that as well? I think we have to follow our passion, right? I mean if you know what you're doing is right The fact is, you know, it might not be profitable at this time that you know, you, you believe that it, it's going to be profitable one day, you should follow that path. I mean, it's, you know, to basically to have that perseverance and tenacity, it's not easy. But I think I'm glad that a lot of these newer millennials, uh, basically the millennials, you start seeing that they're actually very, very passionate about inclusive. I'm seeing like they work with farmers, they work with fishermen, they work with, uh, you know, all these rural uh, communities that they actually want to make a change. So I think you know, the mantra of like making money is not the only thing anymore. I'm very hopeful, but I just want to basically ask this, you know, just continue, continue the path that you have because, uh, you know, if you care about others and you care about where we live, in this case, earth, then you can only be better with that. Okay, that's inspiring. Thank you. Tansi. Very inspiring. I, and I agree a hundred percent. What to add to that? Well, I, I think, um, First is if you're, uh, when you're applying for a job, ask the company where they stand on their values, on their purpose, on their environmental and social sustainability. I think very important for them to hear that people looking for jobs care about those things. And ideally don't take a job with a company that doesn't align with your values and with what you want to accomplish. Um, I would say, you know, uh, 
as Darsana was saying, really learning a new set of skills, like how do you work with stakeholders, a variety of different stakeholders to find a win-win solution to create shared value? That's a really important skill, not one that necessarily is taught. And I think, you know, providing, giving yourself um, opportunities to learn that is, is really, uh, really important. Another is sort of interactive communication skills, right? You know, today in social media, you, you need to be able to engage with people rather than just push stuff out at them. Um, I think, you know, thinking about sustainability as a driver of innovation, of new opportunities, of excitement, of positive things, as opposed to just, I got to manage for like stopping bad stuff. Yes, we have to manage for stopping bad stuff because we've been doing a lot of bad stuff, but also like the field, you know, of being able to be creative to solve for these challenges or to create new opportunities is super exciting. Um, so I, I would say, um, you know, focus on these things. Um, you know, and, 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 uh, and yes, go where your heart is. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to now um, have our presidents, co-presidents, Norman Chen and Pahala Mansuri, who are on the call, just um, close the meeting with their thoughts. Hello. Hi, Norman. Hi. Judy. Okay. Okay. Everything okay? Yes. So uh, I just wanted you to share any of your thoughts as the president okay. of our alumni group here. Sure. Well, I, I guess, I mean, this, this has been a very interesting uh, webinar. And I would like to thank you, uh, Darsono, for all, uh, for the presentation, for such a wonderful presentation on sustainability. It's so interesting. And at the same time, I have to say is an eye opener for myself uh, on this, uh, what uh, sustainable business uh, and carbon credit and how challenging in fact is to achieve uh, this business. In fact, you have built a, a, a very amazing business. Uh, I have to show, uh, it ha you know, it shows that uh, the grit, the passion, the commitment and the soul searching uh, which uh, I'm sure has been, as you said, has been a lot and the mental toughness. And yet uh, with all this, you have consistently uh, stay, you're staying the course to realize your great dreams. I guess this is a, about, uh, is, is, a, is a very good example of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial spirit. And, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, Professor Tensi William for showing that uh, to us as business leader or potential business leader that adopting a sustainable business strategy is in fact a very good business uh, strategy. Uh, it can deliver better financial result while protecting the planets and its people. Uh, nowadays, this is what uh, the world is all, all about with climate change. And uh, especially in, uh, with, with COVID, uh, it shows that we really have to protect the environment. Um, it can make, uh, again, a business resilient. And in fact, if uh, I listen to Darsono, in fact, this sustainable, his, sustain, his business, in fact, is very robust. It's not resilient, it's very robust. He is making more sales today than he was doing last year. So in fact, this is an amazing example. Uh, and um, again, um, I also need to uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, you have done an amazing job, you know, driving this uh, NYU uh, alumni club into a realization. Uh, I, I guess without you, um, I, we, we cannot uh, achieve this, even though this is the, the second uh, meeting. So we, all of us needs to, need to give you a, a good uh, you know, a praise for this. Uh, again, of course, um, I have to thank you all the uh, people, uh, Sinwe or uh, you know, uh, uh, Nelson, uh, uh, Daniel, and all of us that have been drafted but we are a willing draftee because uh, at, at this time, we have also a dream for this NYU Alumni Club. Uh, we want to make this club uh, a robust 
and a vibrant club. Uh, it's not only USC that can do this. We can do it together too. So let's do it. And I'm also um, happy to see today that there are 65 uh, alumni as well as students uh, that have joined and participate and listen to this presentation. And I urge all of you to uh, bring more of your friends to join the club and continue to participate and contribute to make this club great. You know, as I mentioned the last time, uh, when I came uh, back 40 years ago, uh, there was no NYU club and I attended the USC uh, alumni club. I thought, well, you know, uh, I wish uh, there was an NYU club. Now it has taken 40 years uh, to do it. Of course, the student environment uh, has changed a lot in NYU. Well, I was there in 19, started in 1976. There were only about uh, four or five uh, Indonesian students. But today, as I understand it, every year you have about 30 to 40 students. So you have the mass uh, to make this uh, NYU, NYU club, alumni club, a great success. Finally, um, as everyone can see from today, the presentation on sustainability is, is really a very interesting and a, a, a lot of uh, take home value. Uh, this club is committed to deliver excellent topics for discussion uh, and with lots of take home value. So please stay tuned for to next month's presentation, which is on the 18th of uh, August on the journey of a family business to IPO. So this is the, for the next, uh, uh, webinar. So uh, with this, I think I, I will pass this to uh, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, to Pahala, our co-president. Uh, so you please go ahead, Pahala. So I just wanted to see if she's on. I think Pahala may have not been on up to now because I think he may have had to rush to another call. So um, Norman, thank you. And I just would like to share with the alumni uh, community that Norman, um, the president and um, of his company will be sharing the next education call. He and his son, Philip, will talk about the journey of a multi-generation family run um, company into how they have IPO working with many stakeholders. They actually are one of the most recognized brands and multiple brands um, in Indonesia in uh, consumer space uh, for all kind of dairies and uh, meat and seafood and food products, grocery stores, online, e-commerce, retail, cold storage. They have the full value chain, including logistics. So we're really looking forward to his uh, webinar next month on August 18th. Okay. In the meantime, we will be posting all the presentations from our speaker up. Um, and then we also had pre-reading that if you haven't gotten, we will send to you. So thank you everyone for participating. And we look forward to seeing you in August. Thank you to our speakers. And thank you, thank Judy. You thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.